I wanna love like Johnny and June. Rings of fire burning with you. This video is going to go into the whole story of Johnny and June and the full timeline of events. A lot of documentaries or stories or articles or books talk about just certain parts of time, but they don't put it all together. We are going to put it all together. Johnny Cash was born on February 26, 1932 to Ray and Carrie Cash. Johnny's father was a very hard laborer and his mother was a homemaker, but she was also very musical. She played piano and she sang. When Johnny was just a toddler, President Roosevelt rolled out his New Deal plan, which was his plan to help poor farmers and poor Americans and to kickstart the economy after the Great Depression. Part of this New Deal meant that about 600 farmers would be chosen in Arkansas to join this colony, they called it. Basically what it was was a new development of housing that was part of the New Deal. Every house included two bedrooms, a kitchen, a family room, a living room, a front porch, and a back porch. You were also given one mule and a chicken coop and 20 acres of land. All of their groceries for the first year would be paid for by the government, but after that the farmers were on their own and they had to make their own money by growing their own crops. Johnny's father had applied to be part of this program when Johnny was about five years old. Johnny's father, Ray, found out that he had been chosen. So Johnny and his family packed up and moved to Dias, I hope I'm saying that right, Arkansas, where this new colony was built for these farmers. Growing up, Johnny and his siblings worked very, very hard in the field, growing crops, and taking care of livestock and chickens. For a long, long time, Johnny's family did not have any electricity in their home, but they did have one prized possession, a battery-powered radio. After a full day of working in the fields, Johnny, his siblings, and his parents would come inside and sit around this battery-powered radio and listen to music. One of the main radio channels at that time was playing a lot of folk music, which included the band The Carter Family. Johnny remembers sitting and listening to The Carter Family sing for hours and hours at a time. The Carter Family was a musical group that started in 1927, right before the Great Depression. The original group was actually a woman named Sarah, her husband A.P., and their sister-in-law, Maybelle, who had married A.P.'s brother. Sarah and A.P. were actually also first cousins. <laughs> Oops. Very gone with the wind. Sarah, AP, and Maybell really hit it off as a musical group. By 1930, they had sold over 300,000 records. When the Great Depression hit, AP thought, we really got to take this band to the next level because 300,000 was great, but now times are really, really tough and we've really got to dedicate our lives to this even more so than we were before. AP, Sarah, and Maybell really kick it into high gear for their music group. They are traveling around the country, they're touring, they're getting deals with different radio stations, playing their music. This was was kind of the highlight of their career around this time. In 1937, there was a really big flood that hit Dias, Arkansas. It didn't completely ruin Johnny's farm, but it did a lot of damage. It took the Cash family about a year to recover from that flood. Also in 1937, Sarah and AP got a divorce. Sarah married someone named Coy. Also, I'm pretty sure that Coy was her second cousin. Sarah and Coy then moved to California and Sarah left, pretty much abandoned, her two children and AP. When Sarah and AP divorced, the Carter family group completely fell apart because the group was Sarah, AP, and Maybell. AP and Maybell decided to split up the Carter family group. AP and his two children rebranded themselves as the AP Carter family, and Maybell and her three daughters, Anita, June, and Helen, formed a group and rebranded themselves as the Carter sisters and mother Maybell. The Carter sisters and mother Maybell did very, very well. The AP Carter family also recorded several songs and didn't do badly, but the Carter sisters and Mother Maybell really went far with it. They actually ended up attracting the talent of Chet Atkins in 1949, and around that same time, the Grand Ole Opry was approaching the Carter sisters and Mother Maybell, asking them to join the radio station and join the Grand Ole Opry as a permanent fixture of that show. And the Grand Ole Opry actually did not want Chet Atkins to join with them. The Opry was very adamant that this offer was for the Carter sisters and Mother Maybell only, no Chet, but the Carter sisters and Mother Maybell were very insistent that Chet Atkins was part of their band and they would not join the Grand Ole Opry without Chet Atkins. Finally, in 1950, the Grand Ole Opry agreed to allow Chet Atkins and the Carter family sisters into the show on a permanent basis. While all of that drama was happening with the Carter family and the divorce and the rebranding and the Opry, Johnny was still just working on his parents' farm. He had also begun playing guitar himself and singing gospel music. Johnny jokes that he would be in one room playing guitar and singing and his mother would be in another room going, is that you? She was so surprised that this sound was coming out of him, especially after his voice dropped. His mother told him, you've got a gift. God has his hand on you, child. Like, you've got to use that voice because that voice is 
Chef's kiss. However, in 1950, Johnny was turning 18 and he needed to start working a real job. He didn't know at that time how he was going to make any money playing music. He ended up getting an actual job at a car manufacturer making Pontiacs. He jokes that this job did not last long because he really didn't like it and he was pretty bored. Johnny decided to join the Air Force. He went to a base in Texas to learn Russian coding. A few months into being at the Texas base, the Korean War broke out. The Air Force told Johnny that they were going to deploy him. Johnny didn't know where he was being deployed, but he knew that he was going to be deployed somewhere. One night, Johnny and his friends from the base had a night off. They knew they were being deployed soon, so they wanted to go do something really fun. They went to a local ice rink in San Antonio, Texas, and it was there that Johnny met his future wife, Vivian. Johnny says as soon as he met Vivian, he knew that she was the one. He was completely smitten with her. After two or three dates, they both knew that they were the ones for each other. He told Vivian, I know I'm being deployed, but I really, really like you. I love you even, and I know that you're the one. I want to marry you when I come back from this deployment. And Vivian agreed, and he said they pretty much set the wedding date right then and there. That following week after meeting Vivian, Johnny gets deployed to Germany to serve in the Korean War as a radio interceptor. Johnny was very good as a radio interceptor. He was very good at understanding rhythms and how words go to rhythms. He had perfect timing. A lot of people attribute that to his musical background and his brain being wired for music. Johnny ended up being in Germany for three years. He describes it as being the prime of his life where he was just locked up in a room and couldn't make, not a room, but locked up at a base and he couldn't make phone calls. He couldn't interact that much with the outside world. Johnny says he wrote Folsom Prison from the perspective of a boy who was in his prime at war, not able to really be part of the world. During these three years that Johnny was at war and stuck on base, he consistently wrote to Vivian all of these love letters. Vivian would actually keep these love letters until the day she died. Finally, in July of 1954, Johnny gets discharged from Germany and comes back to San Antonio, Texas to Vivian. At this time, Johnny was 22 years old and Vivian was 20. One week after Johnny returned from Germany, Vivian and Johnny were married. Johnny knew immediately after marrying Vivian that he wanted to start a family with her and he wanted to start singing and trying to get on the radio. One year into Johnny and Vivian's marriage, Johnny's brother introduces Johnny to two guitarists who were more plugged into the music scene, I think, than Johnny was at the time. And those two guitarists called themselves the Tennessee Two. They were the backup guitarists to Johnny Cash and they formed a band. In the same year that Johnny met these two guitarists and formed this band, he and Vivian gave birth to their first child named Roseanne. At almost the same time that Roseanne Cash was born, in a completely separate world in Nashville, Tennessee, June gives birth to her first child that she named Rebecca. And she has also married somebody named Carl Smith, who was a country singer that she met at the Opry. June was actually pregnant with Rebecca when she and Carl Smith separated. Her and Carl Smith separated in early 1955, but it wasn't until December of 1956 that June and Carl's divorce was final. June was actually suing Carl Smith for a it seemed like a very hostile divorce, but Carl Smith insisted to a newspaper that it, nobody was mad and it was very civil and it was a mutual agreement. Now, while June Carter is going through that whole divorce with Carl Smith, enter Elvis Presley. <laughs> Elvis was just owning the radio scene in 1955. Johnny knew that Elvis was owning the music scene. So Johnny buys tickets to go to an Elvis show. Elvis was actually playing on the flatbed of a truck. It was a very small shindig that he was playing. It wasn't like a full concert. When Elvis was was playing full concerts, June Carter and her sisters were actually often singing backup for Elvis at Elvis's shows while they also were singing at the Opry. At this show that Johnny went to, June and her sisters were not the backup singers for him. This was just a very small crowd, like I said, on the flatbed of a truck. Johnny goes to this show and thinks, I've got to figure out who Elvis has signed with, who his management is, because he's doing so, so well. Johnny figures out that Sun Records is behind Elvis Presley. Johnny gets himself in touch with a man named Sam Phillips, who was the founder of Sun Records. He approaches Sam with his music one day. Sam completely turned him down. He said, this is gospel music. The market for gospel music is not a good market. I'm not recording gospel music. It's a no. But Johnny would not take no for an answer. In fact, one day, Johnny went to Sun Records and sat on the steps outside of the recording studio until somebody let him in. When they let him in, he took in his guitar and said to Sam Phillips, I want to play more for you. I'll play something that's not gospel. Johnny Cash starts to sing cover songs by the Carter family. Now, Sam Phillips knew 
June and Anita and Helen because they had been backup singers for Elvis multiple times. So he knew these songs very well that Johnny was covering. But he kept saying to Johnny, I want you to play another song that you wrote. And Johnny was very surprised because he considered his music all gospel music. He knew that Sam didn't want to hear gospel music. So Johnny ends up playing the song Hey Porter. After playing Hey Porter, Sam says, I'll tell you what, you go get those two guitarists who have been playing with you this whole time. You bring them in here and we're going to cut that song. And Johnny just left the studio completely elated. It might have been that day that Johnny and Vivian conceived their second child because in April of 1956, Kathy Cash was born. Johnny is just riding a high. Sun Records ends up cutting Hey Porter and signing Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash went on tour with Elvis in that same year. That's where Johnny absolutely exploded in fame. In July of 1956, Johnny was invited to sing at the Grand Ole Opry, where, guess what? June Carter and her sisters pretty much were living. They were always at the Opry. Carl Smith, who was June Carter's separated husband at that time. Everybody says that Carl Smith was her husband at the time. They were not happily married in July of 1956. Trust me. But nonetheless, Carl Smith was still working at the Opry, and so was June, and Carl Smith actually introduces Johnny Cash to the crowd on that day in July of 1956. It was backstage of that same show, Johnny Cash meets June Carter. June kind of laughed because she had known Elvis. She had been singing backup for Elvis. Elvis knew Johnny because they were both working with Sun Records and were touring together. Elvis kept playing Johnny Cash songs for June when they were on tour together. June had already heard Johnny's music before meeting him in person and she was already a fan of Johnny Cash's. Johnny Cash obviously had been listening to June Carter growing up on the farm so he knew who June was and they had kind of a funny exchange when they met for the first time. Johnny was saying, I love your music. I've been listening to you my whole life. And June returned that fascination to Johnny saying, I feel like I already know you because Elvis has been playing all of your music too. One year after Johnny performs at the Grand Ole Opry and meets June, June married a man named Ed. Every time I read about Ed, he was something different. He was a police officer, race car driver, and something else. He just did a lot of the old retired football player. June ends up marrying Ed, and they together had another daughter named Rosie in 1958. After meeting June Carter, Johnny went back to his wife, Vivian, and continued to play music and tour and give Vivian children. In 1959, Cindy Cash was born, and in 1961, Johnny and Vivian gave birth to their last daughter that they would have together named Tara. In 1968, P died. Remember the AP Carter family? He was the husband of Sarah. He passes away. When AP dies, the Carter sisters and mother Maybell reclaimed the name the Carter family as their band name. And in 1962, Johnny invited the Carter family, June, her sisters, and her mother to go on tour with him. While on tour with Johnny, June Carter sings Johnny a song that she wrote called The Ring of Fire. Johnny absolutely loved the song, The Ring of Fire, and actually cut it and released it in 1963. For the next four years, Johnny, the Tennessee Two, and the Carter family would tour all over the country. After four years of doing this though, June's marriage with Ed was really rocky. She was never home. Likewise, Johnny's marriage with Vivian was also really rocky. I think that they both could tell that Johnny and June had a real spark with each other, and they could probably tell that they were fascinated with each other, maybe even loved each other. In 1966, Vivian files for a divorce from Johnny, and in that same year, June and Ed also divorce. Almost immediately after these divorces, Johnny and June recorded the song Jackson, which immediately hit number two on the charts and won a 1968 Grammy. Right after Valentine's Day in 1968, Johnny publicly proposed to June on stage in Canada. June said yes, and one week later, they were married. This proposal was very public. It's actually not the only proposal that Johnny Cash made to June. He reportedly had proposed to June over 30 times before she said yes. By 1969, the duo was everywhere. They were touring constantly. There wasn't a single show that Johnny was at that June wasn't at or that June was at that Johnny wasn't at. They had their solo songs, they had their duet songs, and America just loved them. But more than America loving them, they loved that they were in love. After a couple of years of touring together in 1970, when June was 41 and Johnny was 38, June gave birth to their first and only child together, 
John Carter Cash. This birth was so anticipated by Johnny's family, by June's family, and by the entire country. Everybody loved this love story and was so excited that they were going to have a child together. Red Foley's widowed wife actually gifted June a guitar with Red Foley's signature on it. June was joking that this was at her baby shower and she had put so much effort into looking pretty. And once she got the guitar with Red Foley's signature on it, she just broke down crying. Now, if you remember, Johnny had four daughters before this and June had two daughters before this. So they were kind of thinking this could be a girl. Johnny actually wrote several poems for the baby and in one of them he said, Baby, if you are a girl, that's fine. You're mine, and I love you. <laughs> Everyone was so excited to meet John that as soon as he was born, the nurses set him out for people to see him through the glass before he was even properly clothed or anything like that. Some of the comments that people were making when they saw the baby were comments like, oh, look at his hands. He's got long fingers. He'll be able to play a long neck, you know, in no time, making jokes about him being musical. Johnny and June actually let several newspapers into the hospital for John Carter's birth, so there are lots of articles and pictures out there of them meeting John Carter. Johnny said to one of the papers, there are two things that I will never do to my son. One is name him Sue. The other is name him Johnny Cash Jr. We don't want no junior. A lot of people think that John was named after Johnny, but Johnny Cash says they actually named their son John because of an old Irish tradition that says that you always name your firstborn son John. And although the son was named John Carter, in true Carter fashion, they called him by his middle name, which was Carter, which is kind of funny because June Carter was actually born Valerie June Carter, but went by June. Her first daughter, Rebecca, was actually named Rebecca Carlene Carter, who always went by Carlene. So it was only fitting that John Carter Cash go by Carter. Johnny and June bought a humble little abode in Hendersonville, Tennessee, that overlooked the beautiful Old Hickory Lake. That's where they raised John Carter Cash, and Johnny's parents actually lived just a few houses away from them. They lived there for 35 years until their deaths. In May of 2003, June Carter went to a Nashville hospital to have heart surgery to replace a heart valve. After the heart surgery, she became gravely ill and actually passed away just 12 or 13 days after her surgery. At the funeral, Johnny was 71 years old. He didn't speak at the funeral, but People say that he spent a lot of time sitting over her casket. Just four months after June's passing, Johnny also passed away. His health wasn't the best, but a lot of people think he would have lived a lot longer if June hadn't passed. In that song by Heidi Newfield called Johnny and June, some of the lyrics say, I want to love like Johnny and June, rings of fire burning with you. I want to walk the line until the end of time. I want to love, love you that much, cash it all in, give it all up, and when you're gone, I want to go to, like Johnny and June. For decades, the world has been in awe of the love story of Johnny and June and the patience that June showed to Johnny during his ups and his downs. In 2011, John Carter Cash wrote a book that was called House of Cash. And in this book, he published a love letter that his father Johnny wrote to June on her 65th birthday. In 2015, this letter was voted. I don't know who voted, but the letter was voted in peg, the greatest love letter of all time. In the letter, Johnny says to June, happy birthday, princess. We get old and get used to each other. We think alike. We read each other's minds. We know what the other wants without asking. Sometimes we irritate each other a little bit, maybe sometimes take each other for granted, but once in a while, like today, I meditate on it and realize how lucky I am to share my life with the greatest woman I ever met. You still fascinate and inspire me. You influence me for the better. You're the object of my desire, the number one earthly reason for my existence. I love you very much. Happy birthday, John. In 2005, a member of the band, the Bee Gees, bought Johnny and June's house in Hendersonville, Tennessee, and decided to start renovations on it to restore it to its former glory. However, midway through the renovations in 2007, there was a tragic fire and the house completely burned to the ground. Another house was never built on that property, and you can still go visit the property to this day and see the plot of land where Johnny and June's house once stood. And you can see the amazing view of Old Hickory Lake that they had. Johnny Cash's parents' house is still standing, and like I said, it's just a few houses away from Johnny's house. I'm not going to put the address or where it is because I don't want people driving by their house, <laughs> but if you can still visit Johnny and June's house and you can drive the neighborhood and just get the feeling of, you know, how they could have just walked to Johnny Cash's parents' house anytime they wanted to. 
John Carter Cash is 52 years old today and is still producing music in the famous Cash Cabin, which you can also drive by in Hendersonville, Tennessee as well. Today he is married to a woman named Anna Christina, and together they have two children, Grace June and James Christopher. I wonder if those kids go by their middle names. <laughs> he also has three other children from a previous marriage as well. I will link in the description below all of John Carter Cash's information, his website, his Instagram, all of that so that you can follow him. I will also link in the description description below all of June Carter's daughters pages because all of her daughters actually went into the music business as well. Rebecca Carleen, who was her firstborn, if you remember, to Carl Smith, actually reunited with her father, Carl Smith, and they made a duet together in the mid-90s. I will also link the video to their duet in the description below as well. And if you like this type of content, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the thumbs up button. You have no idea how much it helps just to have one extra subscriber and one extra thumbs up. For adventure on my youth Chasing all my freedoms Down Liberty Avenue